All right, welcome. We're officially recording, so it's about to get real official. This is Fusion 2016, and we're talking about the tension between secular and sacred and a gatekeeping culture. So my first thought, I mean, these words are not new to you. You've heard these, these um, concepts before. But when you think about um, two things, the idea of secular and sacred, we're holding that in one hand, and the idea of gatekeeping in the other hand, um, what, do you think of, what do you think of either of those two? And then I'll ask you what you think about them in the context of each other. So talk to me about secular and sacred. What is what is that? What is the difference? What does it mean? What do they mean to you? Like what is what is the, the concept there? One thing that we actually had a sermon on here at Stone yeah. um, like a month ago maybe um, is things that are open hand and things that are close hand. Okay. And then, um, that was pretty cool to hear about just things that yes, these are things that we can change in the service and then this these are things that we need to keep like worship um, you know, a sermon and just things like that. Yeah. So the things that are necessary, that are that you can't live without, those are the close-handed things. Mm -hmm. So what were they again? What were some close-handed so, things? Like just worship and um, like the fact that we have worship during the message. Yeah. And then you know sermon and prayer and things like that. Okay. So we'll never not do this. Yeah. And what's the open hand? What's the idea there? Um. Like little trends. You know anything that happens. Maybe the type of music that we play. Okay. Sure. Um. I can't remember some other things, but I just remember that concept. Yeah. Does anyone use that language before? Open open fist and closed fist? Yeah. What, how have you guys applied it? Is it similar, the way you've approached uh, it? For us, it was more on a personal level. It wasn't necessarily the service, but the things that basically the close-handed issues are the things that you're going to die for. So yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good. <laughs> you're, you know, and the open-handed, is it deals a lot more with, like, the methodology of things, but that can change, and how you do something can always change, but, you know, the... Yeah. message behind it is kind of the so similar yeah 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 um yes yeah, so i think you, you mentioned it the the message never changes but the method does change yes. yeah have any of you guys been doing ministry for a while where you've seen some methods change over time yeah. what are some have you seen some methods change oh, yeah. what are some that you can remember there, were, there wasn't any uh, electronic media right. when I started out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, video projectors, I imagine, didn't exist. Yeah. Did anybody grow up in a church with overhead projectors? Oh, I was so jealous of the overhead projector guy. Like, that looked like so much fun because you got to be on stage, but your only job was to do the overhead projector. And the really skilled overhead projector people, they would move them up as the words went along. I thought that was the best. I mean, can you imagine to be able to, like, and then they'd get the second one ready, and it was like an artwork. And you'd have, and if you if you haven't experienced this, just imagine you're printing on paper that's uh, clear. It's like plastic, and then you have the ink on it. And then you have a stack of them. And it's not like a piece of paper where you can like look through it properly. You have to like, because they're all transparent, so you can't read them. So anyways, it was, it was an art form. Um, I was a pastor's kid, and my job, I was in the sound booth. One of my jobs was to run the, uh, we didn't, we were really advanced. We didn't have overhead projectors we had slides in the slide machine. So we had this big like six inch binder and you'd open it up and all the worst the songs for each worship slide were on the, like the old school thing. And so before each service you'd have to find the slides and then you'd load them in perfect order, right? And then if the song guy skipped a song, you'd have to pull this like revolving tray out, pull the slides up figure out, then like mark it and then get to it and then and then it'd be upside down or backwards. I mean I'm like nine years old, you know. I'm like, so, okay, so that's a method. The method of our leading worship changes with technology, but our songs are always about Jesus and His grace and love and the greatness of God. So uh, a worship service today would have the same message as a worship service 30 years ago, but our methods are going to change. Right. The methods we hold with an open hand, the message we hold with a closed, closed hand, so to speak. What are some other... What are some other methods that you guys have seen change over the years in your ministry? What do you think, Nick? Like just different events, like a, a VBS event changed to a day camp event. Or right. Uh, I don't know, it became a family event, and it's like that method 
evolved. Yeah. Uh, Halloween. Each of our churches treat Halloween real differently. Yeah. Right now, the, the, the trunk or treat is really popular. Before that, it was more like a h- harvest party. Yeah, before that, it was something probably similar. I mean, before that, maybe it was nothing, right? And, and Halloween is actually a great, a great touch point because Halloween, when we read the word sacred and secular, um, we, have, we have closed fist things we don't let go of. Those are, those are always going to be with us. Then we have open-handed things that are just cultural pieces that may come and go. Mm-hmm. Halloween is a great example because even my grandparents maybe, to celebrate something at church on Halloween seems <laughs> counterintuitive at best, right? Seems almost wrong. Did any of you guys grow up in a church where you would not yeah. you'd like be praying against Halloween? You wouldn't do anything, let alone call it Halloween, right? You would definitely not call it Halloween. Or you would advertise to have a safe alternative, maybe. But did any of you grow, grow up in a church like this? I mean, I did. We did different things. Um, and so you each, you, we kind of approach culture differently depending on where we're at. And sometimes culture, whether we do something or not, it's that closed fist mentality where we're not going to go there, right? That is wrong. We're not, we're not going to let that in, right? As much as it tries to penetrate us, we're not going to go there. Other things we hold more with an open hand where, okay, Halloween, it, it can come, you know, our, it's a method that we may use. It's a cultural method that we are open to, but our message throughout that is going to be the same. And so when it comes to the concept of gatekeeping, that's where your closed fist stuff is. That's where you don't let anything in, right? The gate is closed, and we are limiting this. You don't get in. Where an open-handed thing would be like Halloween, okay. But it's not just things like Halloween. What about things like Star Wars, right? Star Wars. Is Star Wars good or bad? What do you think? Excellent. Excellent. Okay, right? You know, Star Wars BBS. <laughs> Star Wars BBS, right? But if you rewound back to the... Man, when did the first one come out? 76. 76? Yeah. There was a lot of... What, 77? Yeah. Yeah. Not that I know or anything, but... <laughs> there were a lot of Christians who the spiritual overtones of the force and this... It was like demonic, right? And even today, even with my own kids, we'll see them talk about the force and some Christians are like, oh, it's this great metaphor for the Holy Spirit and the Trinity. And I'm like, yeah! Like, I don't know. They're blowing up spaceships. So let's be honest. You know? So some people read into it a little bit, but other people are like, hey, it's just a part of culture. It's neither good or bad. Like anything, we need to address it with moderation. But let's let let's make that be an open-handed thing where we can come or go. We can use Star Wars as part of our... It's just a part of culture. We can embrace it and, and use it with our non-negotiables, right? Um, it's Your sermon never becomes about Luke Skywalker. You're still preaching about Jesus, right? right? Um, but some churches would say, no, you know what, Star Wars, that doesn't... We, we draw the line there. We don't go there. That's too much. Not about Jesus. It's going to be a distraction. It doesn't work with us. And so when we talk about the idea of um, secular and sacred which we still need to find those words. What do those words mean? And gatekeeping. What we're talking about is how we, how our churches, how we interact with popular culture, how we interact with culture around us. Um... There was a guy named John Wesley. You heard John Wesley before? He was in the Wesleyan movement. And he had, um, he started this movement which became known as the, the Holiness Movement. And these were just God-fearing men and women who decided that they would do whatever they could to get as close to Jesus as possible. So anything that wasn't about Jesus wasn't about them. And John Wesley, godly, godly man, said, all right, guys, here's the thing. We need to like, we need to be specific. Let's not just put it up to chance. Let's write down, this is the stuff we're going to do. This is the stuff we're not going to do. We're going to approach Jesus. We're going to be very deliberate about this. We're all about, this is what we're about. If this is what we're about, then let's be all about this. You know, why do, why do anything else when you can do something about Jesus? And so he was very literally methodical and wrote down a method of worship, methods of study, methods of all sorts of stuff, which became known as the Methodist movement. Quite Literally, John Wesley is the founder of the Methodist and Holiness Movement. Well, if you fast forward a few years, um, 
our Pentecostal tradition. Assemblies of God is a Pentecostal church. It was birthed out of the same holiness movement. It, were, it was these Methodists, these holiness people, that were just desperately, passionately seeking after God when the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. And they said, this is something significant. Like we have, this is Acts 1.8. We have received the power, the Holy Spirit gives us power, but not just for power to tell people about Jesus. And one of the greatest missions organizations, one of the greatest missions movements the world has ever known was birthed just over 100 years ago in these some of these churches. Some became uh, known as Assemblies of God. Foursquare was born out of the same thing. Church of God, Church of God in Christ. There's a lot of different churches that trace their roots back through this outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the early 20th century. But all those churches trace their roots back through this Methodist movement, through John Wesley, through this laser beam focus on let's be all about Jesus. And so a lot of people, that tradition is still alive in a lot of ways. And a lot of times, if you and your church want to say, hey, let's do Star Wars Sunday, there's a lot of people in your church who will get very defensive and they'll say, hey, let's do, how about Jesus Sunday, right? And you're like, oh, every Sunday, they're like, they're like, no, Star Wars, kids like Star Wars. Well, they need Jesus, right? <laughs> so here's the question. Is there room, I want to hear what you think, is there room for both Jesus and Star Wars in your Sunday on the same weekend? Like, what do you think? Is there room for both at the same time? Let's do this. What are the pros? What are the pros of doing mixing Jesus and Star Wars? What are the what are the positives? What are, what are some things that? That's a good way to connect with yeah kids. Yeah, you're connecting. Yeah, you're going to where kids are at. At home, so you get their attention. Yeah. Yeah. You get their attention. Yeah. Already got their attention too. Yeah. And now, like, I know I've done this with my little brother. Now, every time that he watches like Harry Potter, every time he watches that, he'll think of. Jesus. Yeah. Just because we've made that connection, even though it obviously doesn't connect at all, um, we've just been able to uh, build that, and so now he has a foundation. For yeah. Something, so. Yeah. Harry Potter. That's probably even a better illustration than Star Wars, <laughs> yeah. right? That's witchcraft, right? You know, like when those came out. I was a youth pastor at the time when that first book came out, and our parents were like livid and scared. Mm -hmm. I, I got a copy of that first book. I'm like, well, I have to read this and see what it's about. And it was a fantasy, you know, novel with magic and things. And I thought, it was not for me, right? But like, I could see how people could be concerned about this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, okay, what are some, give me two more benefits of, of mixing Star Wars and Jesus on Sunday. What's another benefit? What do you think, I, I might have to have some help with this idea, but isn't there like an educational teaching practice that you take something that someone already knows and you apply a new thing to it to make it stick better. Mm -hmm. right. Is that, I, there's got to be some term for it. I'm not, I'm not smart enough to know. But, what's that? Some sort of object. Oh, yeah. I really have, it's almost like a, a, another modality to teach a new thing. Yeah. Something else stick. So that's like, they, if they're already immersed in this world that they, that they know, Star Wars, then when you point out something, something Some to truth of, so yeah. Truth to it, it, it gets yeah. harder. Mm -hmm. One, one expression of that would be like a parable, right? Who, who used lots of parables? Right? Jesus, right? Jesus was like Mr. Parable, right? Now, Jesus was Jesus, so he gets to do whatever he wants, right? But he used the, the popular culture of the day. Like, he used a lot of illustrations from those contexts. Now, we can argue shepherding is a little different than, than Star Wars, cause, and it is, right? This one's total entertainment. The cultures aren't they're not mirrors of each other so we can't draw direct connections but the concept of a parable is very much a biblical concept so yes taking taking uh, com things that are common to kids and using those to explain and express Jesus to them that makes perfect sense um, yeah do you have another good one or another thought either of you guys yeah <laughs> I was going to say it helps them um, not compartmentalize to make Jesus just oh, oh that's great Throughout their life. Yeah. Yeah, talk about that more. What does that mean? To to like connect the thread of like Jesus into their normal life. Um well like you said, <laughs> like, I mean they're getting this okay, for using Star Wars or Harry Potter, whatever. But they're getting that at a lot of different places, whether they're getting it at home or they went to a friend's birthday party, or they went to a movie or at school or sports teams. I mean they're getting these things that all these all these conversations are happening, you know, in all different areas of their lives and so I think it just builds like I said, a common thread that goes, you know, it's not, you don't, Jesus isn't just in a church building mm -hmm. on Sundays or on Wednesdays. Right. It's that, hey, it's applying it to the other areas of my life and, you know, yeah. That's good. We just, yeah. Can we just, can we just pray? Yeah, yeah, what do you think? Another good reason 
and to use something like Star Wars um, is to attract the attention of people who don't normally go to your church. Yeah. 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 My kids went to a Star Wars VBS, and I would say that in our town, which we're from Spokane, that was the number one most popular. <laughs> that was our VBS. Was it? <laughs> Woo, there you go. <laughs> there it is. You see that sign, and your kids are like, Star Wars, I want to go to that. And my kids went to a VBS that had 1,100 kids. Wow. At their VBS. It wasn't That's our amazing. church, but yeah. <laughs> they were a church. But they had 1,100 kids because I think that because it's such a theme that people know and they connect with, mm-hmm. even if they don't know about Jesus, they're like, oh, let's go to the Star Wars VBS. Yeah. And then they learned about Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Let's pause, pause this train of thought because I think we all get it, right? There's cultural things that obviously we want to harness those and we want to use those to point kids towards Jesus, right? But how, what are the dangers of this? Because it can't all be, po- like, what are the, what things do you have to be careful about when you do this sort of thing? What what cautions, what precautions should we take? And where, if we cross the line, what does that look like, maybe? I think sometimes when you take things that are from culture and apply it in, apply Jesus with it, they can kind of, like, water down uh, yeah. their, their view of Jesus and yeah. importance. Um, and they put it on the same shelf. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I know that. Culture. Yeah, that's that's something to be careful about. Yeah. But what you do to counteract that, it's the contrast. It's the real to the fantasy. Yeah. Because we did the Star Wars, and it was all the real force, and this over here is not yeah, the that's good. force. So it, it was a tremendous. Yeah. Which, with yeah. elementary age kids, mm-hmm. you have to be very literal. Yeah. I mean, you guys know, mm-hmm. as kids mature, they learn differently. Yeah. A lot of them, around the, the second, third grade mark, they're transitioning from a like a literal interpretation of the world around them, like this mythical, from like a mythical fantasy world to a literal world. Yeah. So my daughter is right. She's she's transit. She's in first grade, so she still wants to play kitties, right? And she will be a kitten. Rebecca Rebecca talked about this morning. We'll go under the table playing kitty. That's my daughter right now. She's a cat. And when she's a kitty and her four-year-old brother, when they're playing kitties, they are kitties. Yes. They, they're not. In their imagination, they are kitties, right? Because this, this mythical, imaginary world, they're not pretending. It is real to them. But she's about to experience, and she's already, I'm already seeing this, she will go from this phase to stepping through to where nothing is pretend, everything is literal, right? So when you read a Bible verse to a third grader and, you know, Jesus is the bread of life, they're like, Jesus is bread, right? Like, they don't get the metaphor because they're literal. So when you start unpacking, you know, metaphors of the force with children, we have to be so careful to be absolutely literal about it. You know, Jesus, what we're saying, kids, is that Jesus is your, he is this, this, and this. Yeah. Um, But yes, so we do have to be careful because sometimes they can put the metaphor on the same level as the reality and them not differentiating between the two is something we need to be careful about. What's more cautions, things we need to be careful about? Um, I know that when you're teaching a sermon that has to do with, a series that has to do with magic and you relate that to God and well, they find out, like, well, you can't see magic, you can't see these things, like you can't see the tooth fairy, well, I can't see God. Well, the tooth fairy is not real. Yeah. Then is God real? Yeah. And so that's something that you got to be careful about too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just mean. like to see my kids like get excited about about the stories of the Bible, and so and so. Not, I think we have to be careful that we are just saying, hey, this is this is exciting. Like what's in this book is totally real and it's totally the truth, and I'm going to give it to you just like this, yeah. and it's going to be just as exciting as as the force. You know, yeah. as, as something that they know because this is the truth and it's going to take you for your whole life like I want you to understand at least a portion of it now that's just all by itself this is just Jesus and it's just what's in the Bible because everything is real in the Bible and then you just try to um, like make that as exciting I mean and it is exciting to me anyway it's really exciting and so to be able to teach that to your kids and give them that excitement where it's not watered down and it's not anything but the truth of God's word I think that's where it can be I think that's where it's dangerous because then you're not yeah. teaching the whole truth of God's word, maybe, or at least it's not enough, or, like, or you're giving the impression that the word of God is not enough all by itself. Yeah. So that's where. That and that's who Christians around the world are often referred to as people of the book. Like we are people of the book, the Bible, and. 
those of us who grew up in the church, we take this for granted, right? The Bible is our standard. This is the and this is the Word of God. This is our this is our standard. This is our read. This is our measuring stick. This is nothing trumps this. This is God's Word. But there's a lot of fellowships and even groups that would call themselves Christians that don't believe that to be true. And more and more and more, we are going to be set apart by the fact that we hold God's Word in the highest, highest regard. Um, there's been, the and this is not like a new thing, there's been theological movements for hundreds and hundreds of years where they get so smart and so intellectual and just start picking the Bible to pieces and it's like they become smarter than the Bible, right? Well, it's not really true, or oh, it's not really infallible, or it couldn't be this and that, or oh, it's all a metaphor, or you know, th this, you know, whatever. And you can get academic about it, and I can go there, but what's important is that we recognize that this is God God's inspired word and it is our standard so teaching that to kids if we only get like one thing across in the entire time they're with us if they understand that the Bible is God's word that it's alive and living and it's all about Jesus if we can get that across which I understand that's a big idea we've hit a home run you know we've set them up for success in the future as adults and people who can return to that book as a standard because well but that's a close fist thing right culture is going to change 20 years from now this conversation is going to look totally different. We'll probably still be talking about Star Wars, thanks to Disney, but still, yeah. it's going to be different. Yeah. After that, 19. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, episode 19, no doubt. Oh, my goodness. So, um, talk to me about, okay, let's shift gears, because I think we're, we're tracking there. What is, what are the idea of secular and sacred? What do those two words mean to you? Does anyone know what the word sacred means? Say it, so you, you said it. Oh, set apart. Set apart. Something that is sacred has been set apart. And what does that mean in our context, do you think? What does being set apart mean? Not among the common. Mm -hmm. Yes, not among the common. It's different. What else? What else do we read into that phrase, being set apart? For a reason. Yeah, so aside for a reason, yeah. When using just the word sacred, it implies to me a holiness yeah. idea. The, yeah. so the phrase set apart doesn't necessarily do this, the holiness side for me, but sacred to me implies yeah. holiness um, and a, a, a God. Spiritual level, yeah. Spiritual. Yeah. Kind of the not of this in this world, but not of this world. That's right. How can I yeah. It's a famous passage I know you guys know where the Bible describes us as being ambassadors, right? This is not this is not our home. This is not our citizenship is not on earth, but it's in heaven. Yeah. And we're here now as ambassadors for Jesus, right? We're guests here. And we've been set apart, not for this world, but set apart for Christ. And this introduces attention for Christians, right? We say the phrase, we say not in this in this world, but not of this world, yeah. right? So the idea of us being guests here, we're like, we're in it, but this doesn't define us. We're defined by something else. We are, yeah. we are sacred. We are set apart for something different. And yet, we will live and die here as people, right? This is, I mean, it is us. It's our, our bodies are this. Uh, God created us, but we suffer from the consequences of sin here on earth. Like, our bodies will get sick and die, and bad things will happen. This is where we will live until Jesus returns someday, someday soon. Um, but this is us. This is where we live. So we live in this world, but we're not of this world. So how do we manage that tension between um, being set apart but living in a secular world. And I, what does the word secular mean to you? Popular culture. Popular culture. It's just, it's just, a just the worldliness. Yeah. In the world. Yeah. When we use this language, we typically will have a, a real... It's like uh, everything on this side is holy and everything on this side is unholy. And the problem with that and the challenge is that is... Are there things that are spiritually neutral, right? Are there spiritually neutral things? Are there a-spiritual things? And this is where Christians will start to disagree. Because some will say, well, of course, this cup is neither spiritual or not spiritual, right? This coffee is spiritual or not spiritual. But you'll have other people who will say, no, like, this is God. Well, obviously, coffee is spiritual. I mean, that's... <laughs> 
<laughs> we don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you know guys remember where, do you guys know where the word cappuccino comes from? The Cappadocian monks. So people would go to church there and people would fall asleep in their church. This is the, this is the story, right? And so they started making them uh, coffee drinks. And so they would give, the, and so they got, they became known as cappuccinos. Isn't that crazy? That's, I, it could be a totally made up. I could have just made it up right now. But as I'm told, if I understand correctly, yeah, the uh, a cappuccino is from the, the priest there, the Italian priest that gave their people coffee to stay awake during church. I like it. I think I think it's good. I embrace that church history, whether it's true or false. But what do you do, how do you define things that fall between the realm of being sinful and being holy? Because I think if we look about it, there are some amoral aspects to our world, right? Paper cups. Are they Christian or not Christian? You know, well, they're neither... You know, the internet. Is the internet Christian or not Christian? Uh, well, yeah, it's of the devil, right? <laughs> you know, electricity. Is electricity Christian or not Christian? Now, this may blow our mind, but back in the day, some people treated electricity as they treat the internet today. It was this great enabler of, of all sorts of evil, right? Yeah. Television. Is television Christian? Is radio Christian or not Christian? Um, a lot of people say, no, these are... These are bad things, because just look at all the negative impact that they've had on our culture. But in many ways, you know, mid-20th century, the invention of the radio was one of the most effective tools that the gospel has ever seen in telling people about Jesus, right? So on one, one hand, you're playing evil rock and roll music, you know, leading people to hell. And on the other, and on the other way, you have radio stations set up in the most remote corners of the world proclaiming the gospel in a way that's ever, never happened before. Right? Yeah, Caleb. Uh, internet is the same way, right? Internet enables people to do all sorts of horrible things. But it also also is an incredible platform for telling people about Jesus and there are many ministries taking advantage of you know these tools you could say they're neither holy or evil it's the way we use them that imparts meaning to them, right? This paper cup could be used for great evil. I don't know how, but I don't know. I could, like, stab somebody in the eye with it or something. I don't know. I'd give someone a really bad paper cut with this if I wanted to, right? In, it, in which case, it would, be, it would become a, a device of evil, right? Or it could hold my coffee, in which case it's clearly a, a chalice of goodness and grace and mercy, right? <laughs> so we use these things for good or for evil. But the question is, like, what can we fit... What things can we fit into, and Jace, who was originally going to present this, he, he used the idea of a bubble, right? Because Christian, we'll refer to the Christian bubble, right? And we either let things in our bubble, or we have them out of our bubble. It's our, kind of our closed fist, right? To go back to that expression we used earlier. So what do we let in this, and what do we let out of this? What is our, what is our church world? What gets in, and what gets out? Um, some of our church worlds, it's easy to let Star Wars in. Because look, we can deal with Star Wars. We understand it. Um, we understand that it's not the gospel, but we're going to use it. We're going to leverage it. We're going to redeem some of the concepts of force and the relationship between fathers and good versus evil. Um, but others would look at Harry Potter and they'd say, yeah, we'll do Harry Potter, Star Wars, Harry Potter, same category. We we'll use Harry Potter, good versus evil, good guys, bad. But other churches would be like, no, we're not doing Harry Potter. We'll do Star Wars, but not Harry Potter. Other people will look at um, Tolkien, all of his work, and Lord of the Rings, and be like, oh, look at this beautiful metaphor of good versus evil, and friendship, and brotherhood, and fraternity, and all these things, right? And I read the books, and I watch the movies, I'm like, these are great! And my wife looks at him, and she goes, nope, pit of hell, turns it off. She you can't handle it. The first orc, she's done, right? Or the evil guys. I'm like, babe, good beats evil, right? You know, like, we, we, you know, this, is the, this is the gospel. Have you read Revelation? You know, cry out loud. But each of us are sensitive to these, to these things in different ways. So how do you determine, using the metaphor of a bubble, right? What gets in your bubble? What gets out of your bubble? Um, in just a second, we're going to introduce, uh, we wrote, the last few years we've been writing a book. Nick's actually one of our authors that we've been writing. Writing, uh, these books with about children's ministry and Jace writes uh, his chapter and I have the title here it's um, Harry Potter Iron Man and Jesus <laughs> so Jace addresses this head on and he opens up with a story this is his first line this is so I've, I've read and reread all these chapters a hundred times here's how it's and I'll just let this tease you 
um, page, whatever. I can still remember the night we murdered Ariel, the Little Mermaid. Whoa. Youth bonfires were a special summer tradition with s'mores capture the flag and worship music blasting from beat up stereo. But this star-filled country night was different. This night we had been asked together with a specific purpose in mind. And you can kind of, I don't know, if you, did you guys ever have a, a burn your bad stuff night in your youth group growing up? Nick, you said yes. So the idea is that you would go through all your house and find all the bad things in your house and that you would bring it to youth group that night and you'd have a big bonfire and you'd burn all your bad stuff. And Jace is referring to a specific incident in his life where everything Disney was deemed bad and evil and people would burn. Have you been at a party of any boy, anyone boycott Disney in their life? I'm sure we boycott it at least two or three times, right? You know? Um, <laughs> But it's interesting to see how those things change. Like literally now, we have Disney-themed Sundays in our churches, right? We have books about why your children's ministry should be more like Disney. Like, again, my grandparents, they're, real, they're like, they cannot wrap their brain around this. Why would you want Disney, like the master wizard of all evilness, in your church in any form, right? <laughs> So how do you determine what gets in your bubble and what doesn't get in your bubble? What, what are, what's something that tips it where you say, nope, that's a no for us? What is it for you? Where evil wins in a story. Where evil wins in a story. Okay, that's good. What's, yeah. What's glorified. What's yeah. glorified, yeah. Is the bad guy look good? Um, yeah. You know... Uh, Lord of the Rings, the bad guys are clearly bad, yeah. right? The good guys are clearly good. There's very few morally ambiguous yeah. characters there. Um, Star Wars, same thing. There's, it's good. It's a classic good versus evil story. It's easy. But there's a lot of uh, popular culture, things in popular culture, where those lines aren't as clear. Mm -hmm. The anti-hero is emerging as a popular character today, right? The unhero. In fact, all the comic book movies, there was a major theme like in the 80s when a lot of these comics were being drawn up and you have all these popular anti-hero type characters. So, Suicide yes, Squad. you want, yeah, Suicide Squad, a recent yeah, film that came out. All the main characters, all the heroes are like the baddest of the bad guys. So it's like bad versus really bad is the idea and it's dark and, yeah. Not that I watched it or anything. A friend, a friend told me. Um, but, okay, so when the bad guys win, or where you glorify the darkness, or what else, what else is a line that you just won't cross with your church? What do you think? What gets, how do you, what makes it not get in, in the bubble where you're at? When a good guy has to use a bad method. Like two, you know, two wrongs make a right. Yeah. You have to do that to, to win, you know. Yeah. A, uh, an immoral yeah. plot or immoral justification or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Maybe the purpose mm -hmm. behind it. Yeah. If there's, you know, <laughs> depending on what the purpose is, yeah. 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 That Absolutely. would be one, that would be an important one. Yeah. If the purpose is for, you know, somebody said the Star Wars theme and all those good things that we said, you know, but if it's a purpose just to try to bring in outside culture but there's not really a connection there there's yeah yeah and that's, that's hard to discern sometimes, right? Like, um, The Da Vinci Code. Remember when that book came out? Oh, yeah. That was another one. Straight out of the pit of hell, right? It was horrible. Banned all over. And again, same, I did the same thing I did with Harry Potter. I'm like, well, i got to read this book and see what it's about. And it was just a thriller, alternative history. But it made the church look like it was this big fraud, right? Were, were the intentions of... Dan Brown's author, right? Were the intentions of Dan Brown to undermine the legitimacy of the church or just entertain? And does it matter, right? Say it again. People say that it, it was intentional. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. In that case, according to that filter, it wouldn't pass, right? We're not having <laughs> we're not having a Da Vinci Code themed Sunday, right? <laughs> <laughs> Under your pew is a Bible. <laughs> Written in Latin, or is it? Yeah. <laughs> it's actually just gibberish. We had pieces of the Apocrypha throughout the church. Yeah. <laughs> Open your hymnals to page 666. <laughs> no! Yeah. That's horrible. Oh. I don't know if I've seen it that thick of a hymnal, but yeah. What song do you put on that page? Do you just leave it blank? You gotta skip it, right? Oh, sorry, that's a little. Oh man, that's funny. Sorry, I'm thinking out loud. Here's 
here's three ways. Here's three ways we, we respond to culture. All right. So sorry, note takers. I don't know if you had anything good to write down yet, but here's three things we do. We reject it. We receive it, or we redeem it. Okay. And you have to choose. This is your filter. Okay. And we do this even if we don't know that we do it. We reject culture. We say this glorifies darkness. This glorifies abuse. This glorifies selfishness. This does not glorify what we want to glorify. So we reject it. Um, an example in my life. My kids, I'll watch a silly YouTube video with them before we go to bed. Well, there's a lot of videos where kids open up toys. Have you seen these? They're really popular. And so I thought, oh, that's kind of fun. Like, they like Angry Birds and stuff, little Legos, so we'll watch a little fun video. But it, I saw in my children at age six and four a, a desire to own and purchase these things that was very ungodly. It was selfish. It was very commercialistic. Like, it was not good. It was planting something selfish in them that when I saw it, I said, no, we are rejecting that. They are of an age. They're so impressionable right now. They cannot watch these videos. Now, would I show a video like that in church one time? Sure. It's, it would be, for that audience, elementary age audience, it may be no big deal. But for my kids... That does not get into our bubble right now. We do not watch. In fact, <laughs> when my, when at my birthday, he, my, my son doesn't call it opening presents. He calls it unboxing. <laughs> like, you want to unbox your presents? Like that, I'm like, that's, that's a red flag, right? That's when you start, go back to the cat videos quick. Because those, at least. <laughs> my kids try to walk around the house doing YouTube-worthy stuff. So he's like, Dad, 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 I'm going to run across the room. Then I'm going to fall down. Quick, get your camera out. Like, so it doesn't work like that. You just catch. He doesn't understand it. So he wants to be uh, his own YouTube star. Okay. So we reject culture, right? We don't do Da Vinci Code. That's bad. That's undermining the church for us, for our culture, for our audience. We're not going to go there, right? Um, for maybe for some of you, it's Star Wars. Nope. It's too mystical. It's too new agey. We're just not going to go there. And you have to decide if it, if it gets in your bubble or not. Because we all have a bubble to think, oh, we don't have a bubble. We let anything in and out. That's stupid. Nobody really does that, right? And if you're doing that, it's foolish. Foolishness, because the, the world is not about Jesus. And so when these things come in unchecked and unfiltered, please don't do that. Don't do that to your church. Don't do that to your family. Don't do that to yourself, right? You, you're all mature adults. You can choose what to watch, and you can hopefully self-regulate and discern what is impacting you spiritually and not. But it's different for each of us, right? It's different for each of us. You and I have different weaknesses, right? My wife, she can't watch like sad movies get her depressed. For her, it's a spiritual thing. She doesn't watch depressing, sad movies. Those have a different impact on me, right? I get something, I get something out of it. I like the direction. I like the art, artsy value. I like the story. It doesn't impact me spiritually in the same way it impacts her. And it takes a very mature, self-aware person to realize that, hey, this, this innocuous thing may not mean anything to you spiritually, but to somebody else, it does. So don't go there, right? So reject. The second thing, receive. You say, hey, this is actually a good thing. A lot of times when we look at like marketing or posting on social networks, we say, hey, you know what? We can receive that. We can do things better. We can promote our stuff better. We can do our flyers better. There's lots of aspects of po popular culture that are just true because they're true. There's a saying, and this ruffles people's feathers, so I'm going to give it to you. All truth is God's truth. Um, one plus one equals two. Is that true? Yes. Is it some mathematician's truth? No, it's God's truth, right? The way a cell divides and multiplies. Is that the truth of a scientist? No, that's God's truth. All truth is God's truth. Um, I'll write that one down and think about it someday. Anything we discover to be true that isn't true because science isn't true because whatever. It's true because God made it that way. So if we discover that some marketing technique is effective, is that the marketer's truth or is that God's truth? You're following that logic, you say, this is true because God made it true. This is how God made us and wired us, right? This parenting truth, this insight from Eric Erickson or PSGA or some psychological truth. I mean, this are, psychology is like a new science, right? Um, some people wouldn't even consider it a science still, like old school people. But if you find some sort of thing about you know de developmental psychology that's true, it's not true because Eric Erickson found that this is true. It's true because that's how God made us to be, right? So the second way to respond is we can receive culture. 
if it's true, we should leverage all of God's truth to have the greatest amount of effectiveness we can. And whether that comes from someone behind a pulpit or someone behind uh, a scientific beaker or someone even behind a screen in Hollywood, there's lots of truth that we can find in the storytelling today. They're pulling from just universal aspects of who we are. Um, Nick, I'm picking on you, Nick. Nick's done a talk for us several times at Fusion about uh, Pixar and how they leverage so much of just the human story. And Pixar is not an evangelical organization, but Pixar taps into something about humanity and about people and identity and relationships. It's not Pixar's truth. That's God's truth that Pixar is tapping into. Yeah. And a lot of times the most powerful pieces of art and architecture and literature tap into some of our God-created, just who we are because God made us who we are. That's why those things are powerful. Not because, you know, uh, these authors are brilliant, but because they've learned and discovered something that is true because that's how God made it. Yeah. The last thing, reject, receive. So reject says, nope, we're not going there. Receive says, this is good. We need to embrace this. This is part of God's truth. The third one is redeem. And this is where it requires the most discernment from you to say, okay, that's kind of neutral. We can take this and use it to point to Jesus, right? And we're using Star Wars as an example. Star Wars, spiritually neutral, right? You can abuse it. You can abuse everything, right? Seahawks. Seahawks is an idol for a lot of people. It needs to be outside the bubble. But a lot of our churches say, you know what? We're going to redeem Seahawks. We're going to do a Seahawks Sunday and we're going to take this thing that's extremely popular and we're going to pull a jiu-jitsu move. Right? We're going to get people into the church and with that momentum, we're going to throw them on the mat for Jesus. Right? We're going to use the momentum of, of our opponent, this very popular thing, and we're going to harness that to tell people about Jesus. And again, this isn't a new thing. Talk about the radio stations. Christian music, popular Christian music. For years and years, Christians have created popular music and made these songs and messages about Jesus. I mean, famously, you've probably heard a lot of the hymns written uh, by the early Lutherans and the followers of Martin Luther. These were bar tunes, literally tunes from the pubs, right? In cultures that were suffering from alcoholism and domestic violence and all the things that, that alcohol abuse often brings into a community, they would take these very familiar tune, tunes and they would redeem them. They would take these songs and make them about Jesus. And there are certain parts of our culture that we can redeem in the same way. What is it? You have to figure it out. <laughs> we can't tell you, Star Wars good, Harry Potter bad. That's you and your church and your pastor, and you have to wrestle with those things theologically. And just as watching sad movies may cause my wife's heart to be saddened, but not me, it could have a spiritual impact on her, your church is going to have its own spiritual composition. And you're going to have people that you're going to be sensitive to. You know, what's the Bible say about us causing other people to stumble? Right? Yeah. Don't do it. That's really, really bad. Um, and at the same time, we have to realize everything is going to cause somebody to stumble. So where do we draw the line, right? Some guys really struggle with idolizing and gals, the Seahawks. They worship them. Does that mean your church shouldn't do a Seahawks Sunday because there's a few people that struggle with it? Maybe. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Um, Star Wars. Some people, it offends them spiritually. Does that mean that you should not do a Star Wars Sunday? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. These are questions that you have to answer, and you have to thoughtfully approach. And when you do, you're going to find opportunities to connect and relate to your culture in a way you've never done it before. But if you just kind of just go ahead without thinking about these things, you could step on a lot of toes and do more harm than good without, being care without carefully considering how to engage people in this way. Yeah. So, I've talked longer than I wanted to. It is time for us to run upstairs. So, I'm going to break. I want to encourage you. Jace wrote a great chapter. Um, What's the book called? The book is called Fusion Children's Ministries. We're just going to go upstairs and announce it in just a second. If you wait till tomorrow, you can download it for free. We tried to make it, but we'll have, we have paper versions and stuff upstairs, so you can grab a copy if you want. Any, yeah, all the books. Uh, yes, book three. It's a green one. So, um, all the proceeds go to support our children's ministries. So, it goes to support this conference and other things. So, um, it's a good way to support what we're doing together as well. Um, but we'll talk about it tonight. So, anyways, thank you guys. Yeah, thanks for running in. Sorry, talk so much, but it was good.